a very good evening to, uh, to, you, to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say thank you to uh, Samuel Spapa and also the Siam Society for giving me an opportunity to share with you the archaeology of KL. And uh, um, I'll be sharing a few aspects of the archaeology of KL, uh, starting from the introduction as well as the the archaeology itself, based on the case studies, and then um, also highlighting some issues with the archaeology of KL, which could be the same uh, recurring theme for all the capitals in Southeast Asia, especially when it comes to the archaeology. And uh, towards the end, uh, I'll, uh, I will highlight some issues and then how a uh, few examples that we actually did in Penang uh, in order to bring back the community to archaeology as, as well as uh, trying to get them to understand more about archaeology. So my name is Shaiko Shahidan, I'm actually a fellow at the Centre for Global Archaeological Research and as, uh, as well as a National Board Member for Ecomos Malaysia. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, I'll give uh, the story of KL from four different contexts. So for those of you who don't know where Malaysia is, it's actually right there. I mean, we have the Peninsula Malaysia and also the Eastern Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, Kuala Lumpur is the capital city. Uh, if we want to talk about the archaeology and the history of Kuala Lumpur, it is also important to understand that uh, the whole Cloud Valley, where the Kuala Lumpur is actually where, where it is now. Um, we have to talk also uh, about city of Klang, uh, which is located about 60 kilometers away from Kuala Lumpur in the state of Selangor. So Kuala Lumpur used to be part of Selangor, but then uh, now it was a uh, 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 federal territory by itself. So from a geographical context, the definition or the meaning of Kuala Lumpur the Kuala is, uh, is, uh, is a confluence where the two river meet and Lumpur is a uh, wet mud. So um, by looking at this map on how the Kuala Lumpur expand from 1818 up until 1974 and until now, 2019, the population grew ex exponentially and much bigger nowadays. So uh, when we talk about Kuala Lumpur itself, we also have to talk about the Greater KL or the Club Valley that comprise of uh, 2,900 square kilometers. And uh, the population of course is less than uh, what you have here in Bangkok. Uh, we've been observing you know, crowds during rush hours. It's much more, um, a huge number of crowds compared to KL. But uh, the current population now is about 1.6 million in, in Kuala Lumpur itself. But the total uh, is about 7 million for the Great Kedal. So, to talk about the archaeology, just to give you the context of it, it's, it's talking about the archaeology of the Great Kedal of the Club Valley. So, the prehistory, uh, when you talk about archaeology of KL, the beginning of the archaeology should be look not in KL, but actually Club in Slavia. That's where the records existed at, as for now. So it's actually the whole Klang Valley used to be a very, um, a, a, quite, quite, a, there's a lot of uh, settlements within the Klang Valley. And uh, from the record, archaeologically, there's artifacts from the Neolithic period, about 2800 BC, and also the Metal Age, about 500 BC, discovered in Klang. Uh, and some of these artifacts are now stored in the British Museum in London. So Clown was also mentioned uh, in the 14th century. So there is actually a huge gap, a huge data between the Metal Age until the Sultanate period, the 14th century uh, uh, AD. But it was mentioned in uh, Nagara Kretagama, Majapahit Akbaria, one of the big opus. And the Clown River was already these are some of the artifacts uh, that is currently now stored in the um, British Museum, uh, the, the Dong Song, uh, the Bell, and also some iron implements. Klang River was already marked and named on the earliest maritime charts of Chinese Admiral Chang Ho on his visit to Malacca from 1409 to 14, uh, 1433. 
And uh, during the Sultanate period, especially during the Mulakid period, Klang was a political outpost of uh, Malaykan Sultanate, um, as mentioned by Khalid in 2017. So the whole idea about the history, the prehistory, is talking about Klang, but not the Kuala Lumpur itself. So when does it all start that actually in Kuala Lumpur? So the historical context is that um, in 1857, because Klang was already established as a very well-known political outpost, a trading area. So 1857, Raja Abdullah, the son of Raja the ruler of Klang, arrived in Kuala Lumpur uh, for one reason, to prospect tin mines, uh, because there was a lot of uh, tin mining outside of KL, in Klang, and Luko in the Grismilan, in the southern part and in the northern part of KL, together with 87 Chinese prospectors. Uh, out of these 87 Chinese pro prospectors, only 13 actually survived after the malaria fever, uh, after all the troubles they had in opening up Kuala Lumpur. Uh, there's uh, also a question of uh, who actually founded Kuala Lumpur. In the recent books by Abu Raza Luis, uh, recently published, 2018, um, is He's established that, uh, well, the well-known version of uh, history is the Kuala Lumpur was uh, opened by the Chinese named Yam Ahloy, which is the third captain, Chinese captain. But then, you know, after certain debates, I mean, the public debates as well, it has been established that Sultan Kuala which is from Indonesia, uh, actually founder of KL, because there was an evidence of him trading near Ampak, earlier than 1857, before Raja Abdullah came from Klang. And uh, Sultan Kwasa was like uh, doing business with some of the Chinese as well, but outside of Kuala Lumpur. There was no mining inside KL, but outskirts of KL, yes, there are a lot of tin mines. KL was straight settlement survey outland mines, as proven by Galik. As you can see from this map, Kuala Lumpur and its communication, you can actually see some of the roads, uh, mostly the train roads as well as the truck road, was established to connect all the tin mines outside of Kuala Lumpur. So by 18, um, before the 1870s, there's still not, not a big mines like uh, a very established tin mines in Kuala Lumpur. So from Klang, as you can see, uh, the, the road connecting is 1878, 1870, 1870, uh, also said 1874, going to Batu. So all the earliest route is connecting Kuala Lumpur outside of KL itself, to connect Kuala Lumpur with the tin mines. And throughout, after certain times, then more mines has been prospected around uh, the Klang Valley. So they started building more and more roads, recent roads. So, these are another map from uh, Straits Branch Royal Aesthetic Society, 1877, uh, mark all the main uh, water bodies as well as the main um, um, tin mines, uh, which is also uh, quite uh, important for them to understand you know, how to connect these tin mines with uh, Kuala Lumpur. So, Yang Ahloy became the third capital of China of KL in 1868. And uh, because of, uh, I don't want to go into details of all the clan war, there's a lot of wars between the, the, the local chieftain um, and then some of these uh, Chinese uh, uh, miners also take sides with all these uh, local warlords. But apparently it's Yap uh, who actually survived um, all the wars. And uh, he actually developed or redeveloped KL into, uh, into the current, I mean, right, the foundation into the current KL nowadays. So that's a picture of Yama Hoi. And then when he established his outpost in KL, so um, it's, uh, if some of you might have been, to, uh, have been to KL, you know, the central market, where it's actually uh, the center of KL, is used to be, to, it, there was uh, his house actually near the old market square, the central market. And then he established most of the uh, basic networks of roads uh, in KL during that time. So uh, basically, if you look at the timeline of KL, uh, 1818, that's actually when it begins, I mean, historically, 
uh, it was opened by Sultan Kuasa because of the thin mining outside of KL. And then you have all the Chinese uh, Kapitan, you know, Hughes Hu and Yap Ahloy is actually the third Kapitan. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, the debate saying that Yap Ahloy doesn't really open KL because he was coming a bit much later compared to Sultan Kuasa. So KL, uh, basically the history as far as we can trace is only from 1818. But when we talk about Klang, it's from the Neolithic period. So there's actually a huge gap between the Metal Age, 500 BC to 1880. So the question is, what is Kuala Lumpur archaeology? Do you think it's still possible to, to find uh, artifacts or anything that related to the archaeology of Kuala Lumpur prior to 1818 or, or after 500 BC? So I guess that is the main question. Uh, so I would like to try to share some of the evidence of archaeology of KL through issues uh, and case studies. Uh, there are a few sites that I'm going to highlight, a uh, few projects, for example. Uh, the main one are located within the KL itself, the Masjid Jame River of Life, which is Masjid Jame is part of the River of Life project, uh, railway yard of uh, go down and also uh, in the end just trying to highlight the challenges uh, that we are facing as an archaeologist uh, working in the cities in, uh, like KL. So let's start with uh, Masjid Jame in Kuala Lumpur. So Masjid Jame is located right in, like, in the center of Kuala Lumpur. Um, as you can see, I'll show you some map. So this is one of the earliest maps of KL. So as I mentioned, you know, the confluence of two rivers. So that is the river of uh, Bumba, and this is the river of Kla. So when uh, Raja Abdullah arrived in KL, he opened up a settlement here. And in 1870s, that area was marked as the Malay burial ground. And then you have all other uh, Kampung Rawa is a Rawa village. Rawa is a group of people from Sumatra. So they, when they arrived in KL, they built a settlement here. And then you have the Chinese uh, settlement, especially on this, on the southern part. And since uh, Chinese and the Malay they have a different culture, different kind of uh, um, uh, lifestyle, so it's very much you can actually see the segregation between the Malay, the Malay, and also the uh, the Chinese. Uh, but uh, one of the one of the texts mentioning about the diet specifically, because the Chinese eat pig, there's a lot of uh, pig race, especially on the southern part of uh, uh, KL. So that's why the Malays actually started to build out their uh, communities on the on the northern part of it. So that's 1870s. Uh, it has been marked as Malay burial ground. In 1889, again, I mean the same area. One of the earliest place of uh, that they opened the Kuala Lumpur, 1889, is also marked as a burial ground. As you can see now, the city becomes bigger. There's more roads and more buildings. In 1895, it still marks as burial ground. And in 1903, a sketch of that area also mentioned as the burial ground. In 1910, you can actually see much more details uh, map of Kuala Lumpur. I guess uh, the British are be, you know, expanding the city, so they said, okay, this is a, a good time to actually map everything in much more detail. And then you can actually see that burial grounds, there's a, there's a small dots and small square. This plots of burial might be with a structure of fence. If you zoom in, you can actually see a very dedicated plot uh, some, of, some of it is small, some of it is big, you know. In Malay, we call it Kramat or sacred places because, you know, all these um, um, uh, people with, uh, with high position, they, they tended to, to associate it with uh, a, a supernatural powers after they die. So the, the, the construction of the burial also reflect the status symbol of the person when he was still alive. And uh, one of the pictures, um, titled as the, uh, you know, captioned as a river view behind the office of Kuala Lumpur. This is where the 
uh, bangunan Sultan Abu Samad or the Dataran Merdeka, the Merdeka Square is located at on this side. And this is where the Malay burial ground was located. If we zoom in, you can actually see some of the gravestone there. And this is some of the plot, the big one, you know, that signify the status of the, of the deceased. And then apparently, I mean, surprisingly, the river is not that deep. So you can actually see all cows and people actually So from archival records in 1912, I mean the British are very much, you know, uh, uh, very much keen on recording almost everything, small things, you know, bad things. But it mentioned here that the contractor for the new Supreme Court has encroached on the Malay cemetery and that the graves are in danger of being damaged and that a fence or hoarding may be put up to shut off the cemetery. So there was an attempt by the British to actually safeguard a Malay uh, burial ground. Again, from the straight time, 12 August 1915, it mentioned that nobody seems to know whose graves they are. It shows that even the local community at that time has become disconnected with this grave because it was a very old grave. It's also mentioned that men who pass them are shot, a few remarks are made and nothing is done. The Nibul Karim shop, who is paid by the government, has no funds for the purpose. So apparently the graves is not in a good condition, but nobody really cares and maybe people who actually care for it don't really have a means or resources to take care of, take good care of it. So what happened is that in 2016, 2017, uh, the whole project, the River of Life project, uh, took off. And then uh, I guess Prof. Kafa will talk more about that later on. Uh, so some part of the, the the mosque, they wanted to build a nice fountain because the whole idea of River of Life is to connect the community that lives uh, by the river and even the urban setting back to you know understanding and appreciating more about the river itself. So when they started building this, so what they found is actually a granite, a gravestone started to coming up, you know, because it was marked as a burial ground for many, many years. So they, they kind of like know that this is actually a burial ground. So you have 14 granites. So they discovered, the, 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 contract, the contractor discovered 14 granite uh, gravestone and one marble gravestone. Interestingly, uh, upon inspection, close inspection on site, you also find a lot of ceramics, you know, um, mostly colonial and also uh, Chinese ceramics scattered on the ground as well. And uh, interestingly, when we take a closer inspection, a closer look at those uh, gravestones, we can actually see some of it has wordings, you know, old Jawi, old Arabic wordings. And we try to decide what they <coughs> So this one say three day or night sana, because most of the, uh, they are Muslim, so the day also follows the Muslim calendar, the, the Islamic calendar. 1309 is equivalent to 1892. So this corresponds with the map. This actually shows that it's actually a real Muslim ground. The picture shows a real Muslim ground, Muslim burial ground, and it actually corresponds. But we know exactly who these people were. Uh, Said Abdullah Ben Said Al Hazid. So it's a, it's a, it's it's actually uh, local people. The, another gravestone shows that um, an epigraphy of Alias as the name Ben means the son of Muhammad Yusuf Arab. Uh, buried or died on 24 of July 2010, which is equivalent to 15 November 1892. Remember that from the previous map that I've shown you, the Rabba people lives not far from the Muslim ground, Muslim burial ground. So these are evidence of the original people of the earliest settled, settlers uh, that, that, that live in this area in Kuala Lumpur. So the, interestingly, out of all those 15, 16 gravestones, there is this Archinese grave gravestone. In Southeast Asia, Archinese gravestone is considered as one of the, uh, the, the, the gravestone because it's not just uh, represented a gravestone, but it's made in Aceh from a sand, sandstone and then exported out of Aceh to many uh, areas of many countries around Southeast Asia. It's a status symbol to have 
uh, a, a, a burial with the archive stone. And based on the decorations, because this is, has been extens extensively studied by Indonesian, Malaysian, and so many scholars around this region, and based on this um, designs and typology, you can actually see it's actually from uh, design K, which is around 1700 to 1800. That is way much earlier, even compared to the, to the burial itself. You know, so you have now you have a very clear evidence of the people or the community in KL way much earlier than what is has been recorded by the British or uh, uh, by uh, uh, by the historian. So when when this was becoming an issue because uh, the developer has already complied with HIE, blah blah blah. So uh, but the most important thing is to understand that now you have a direct evidence of the early centers of KL, uh, much earlier than what we thought, and uh, it's a rock solid proof of people of one of the earliest group of communities in KL. It shows a direct evidence of that. So Masjid Jamia is one of the case study that I'm trying to share, you know, trying to understand the archaeology of KL and what is happening before uh, 1880 or before 1858. Another case study is the uh, River of Life. Uh, Masjid Jamia is also part of the River of Life, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the whole project is trying to uh, rejuvenate the river, trying to uh, make the river uh, uh, clean and uh, so that the, the community appreciate it better and connect, uh, connect back with the river. So uh, in central Kuala Lumpur, so this is actually the aerial photo of the Gomba River and uh, uh, GCB consultant, actually one of the consultants working on the River of Life project, so they shared with me this picture. And then um, apparently they did some excavation along the Klang River and also the Gomba River. So they actually found a uh, few ceramics. This is a 19th century Chikpa white and blue bowl. So that will have some of the artifacts that they found. They also found a colonial materials. For example, this is a 20th century uh, Hoboken and Co. from Rotterdam. It's actually a gin bottle, a very nice one. Currently, we are working on a project on, uh, uh, in Pinan, uh, on the Fort Cornwallis. Uh, we, we had so many of these bottles, but not in this form. It's all, you know, uh, fragments and uh, we can't find a complete one, but they actually found a complete one there in KL. They also found a lot of uh, 19th century late porcelain with flower motif and seal mark. So it shows again I mean, the evidence of archaeology based on artifacts. And another one is 19th century Qinghua, late Qing, white and blue bowl. So this is direct evidence of trade, direct evidence of uh, utilization by the people. And also um, it's, it's an artifact. So according to National Heritage Act, basically you have to uh, keep and also uh, protect it. So that's another case study, River of Life. So, um, and now for the, the last one, is the Railway Yard of North Wood Yards. Uh, this is much more uh, later on, I mean, during the British colonial period. So uh, this is uh, the area of the picture in 2016. Uh, that's how it looks like, I mean, part of the, of the wall. But then it got demolished by the developer. And then become an issue as well in the newspaper. You know, everyone started to, you know, questioning who's who's to blame, blah blah blah. But then uh, again, uh, I guess it's something. Is is for for me personally, it's the whole process of appreciating heritage by uh, understanding um, uh, the the loss of it. So the challenges are based on these three uh, case study, especially in KL. Is uh, I guess this is also a recurring theme in most of the Southern Asian capital or anywhere in, in Southern Asia. It's the development versus conservation and preservation. So some people want development, some people want to maintain the old things. So there's always a challenge for that. Number two is what should be protected and altered and what not, and who should decide for it. So this is also a, a vital issue for us, especially among the researchers of uh, who actually should define what is heritage and especially in the urban setting where in the context of KL 
you have all the people, majority of the people in KL are coming from outside KL. So they come and work and stay in KL. So the attachment with KL, historically, is not that strong. It's not your hometown. You don't want that. I mean, you, you don't really come from KL itself. So well, what kind of definition or what kind of, uh, how do you actually view heritage, per se? And then uh, the challenge is more this literary approach. You have people from so many fields, different studies, and try to get them together and work on it. Like, for example, the case of the masjid, I mean, when you had that kind of things, I mean, you need to consult someone who actually knows how to read the whole uh, old Arabic, for example, uh, and uh, someone who knows the architecture of or the typology of the of the gravestone. So multidisciplinary approach is also part of the challenge in uh, urban archaeology. And most of all, importantly, importantly, is the variety that we want to come up from all this uh, research or all this uh, data that we have. This is, I think, much one of the biggest challenge that we face, especially working in the urban side. So having those challenges, uh, we've been working on a uh, few uh, things, I mean, for the past couple of years. Uh, one of it is trying to push for uh, a much thorough heritage impact assessment uh, on potential archaeology, uh, especially on other heritage sites which is not listed. For example, in Malaysia, you have Pinang, Malacca, listed as a World Heritage Site, so the inner core of the city is much more protected. But in the case of KL, it's not really uh, you still have the National Heritage, Heritage Act govern the area, but there is a, a, a legacidal attitude by some of the developers when it comes to protecting the heritage and also the archaeology. So there should be a standard development assessment as well. So, uh, like in UK, you have the PPG, PP, uh, PPG 15 last time, and then I think personally, one of the issues is doing it, doing the assessment before, not during or after. In the case of Masjid Jami, the evaluation comes after they discover the design. So it's, a, it's kind of lost. Public archaeology community, I guess this is one of the issues as well. Uh, we are facing, especially in Malaysia, trying to connect back the public and the community. And uh, what we did, uh, I'm going to show you later for the examples. Uh, this is one of the projects that we do. And also uh, trying to engage school children you know, with us. And uh, this is also another challenge, trying to talk to the developer, to the people who are actually pro-development of the ROI, return of investment, versus the ROA, return of awareness. Because it's something that, that is uh, challenging, I would say, trying to talk uh, to people who doesn't really think that heritage is that important. But to have them understand the ROA is also important as well. The cross-working commercial and academia, so there's a, a lot of research uh, on, on the, uh, the cross-working, um, how public archaeology uh, and uh, university uh, having uh, multiple uh, dimensions to work. And then academic teachers, the technical conservation staff, every aspect of the society, of the research, and also the cultural research, resource management with a multidisciplinary approach as well. The last part of my talk will be the project, or I just keep want to share some examples on what we did because uh, we are based in Penang, but when it comes to the archaeology of uh, Malaysia, usually we will we will travel from Penang to KL to to um, to address the issue. So these are some of the projects that we've been conducted, mostly in urban sites, especially in Peninsular Malaysia. The whole idea is to bring people closer to the past and reveal the connections between the past and the present. So uh, the sites that we are working on at the moment is Fort Cornelius in Pinang. Uh, we had a program called the Young Archaeologist Program where we give opportunities for students, school children especially, to excavate, to experience archaeology for maybe a couple of hours over the day. So uh, we get of them from local schools, uh, open up a trench and then let them uh, dig. As you can see, some of them are not like school children. I mean, the parents get more excited working on the excavation rather than the kids. 
And I will also tell them on, on the basic analysis of uh, excavation and analysis. And then at the end, I mean, we try to understand their view and their perception about archaeology uh, by, you know, making one small posters on a Manila card, for example. How do you, what do you understand about the archaeology of this place? And it's, it's very refreshing and it's very interesting to learn their views, which is sometimes is completely opposite from what you see, but it's, 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 it's a very um, and thrilling experience for us to understand archaeology, especially from, from young kids like them. Another site, uh, this is located in Ipoh, uh, it's called Guotambul, in, in the state of Para. That's about two hours away from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, it's, it's a rock, rock art site, it's actually uh, Dr. Noel's uh, master's thesis site. So we have a program called uh, uh, Guotambul, where Gua is cave, Tambul cave uh, rock art. Uh, uh, experience. Uh, so the, the, the rock art is actually located quite high up above the ground. So we will bring people and then uh, give them a huge cup, uh, cardboard and uh, a sticker of each and different motifs of the rock art and let them spot the rock art and put the sticker on the cardboard. So on, on the cup, uh, on the on the board. So they, they kind of like see where the location of the rock art and try to understand the motives of it. So and then we also let them experience, you know, they can paint their own rock art or they can paint whatever they want. So we give them a POP, plaster of Paris, and then they can draw using the same material uh, hematite that they found uh, around the, the world tower, around the cave, which is the same material used by the prehistoric people to actually make the rock art. And uh, this is trying to connect back community with, with, with archaeology. So in the picture is uh, Batin Alam. He's, a, he's an aborigines from uh, not far from the place. Um, so you know, I mean, the rock art itself is about 5,000 years old. So we believe that the, the, the community, the prehistoric community, uh, of the local community used, uh, you know, who were the one in charge of you know, drawing the, the rock art. But then nowadays we can see that even the local aborigines doesn't know much about the rock art itself. So we're trying to reconnect back, trying to see because some of the uh, motives of the rock arts, they're still using it in their daily lives nowadays. You know, in their pattern design, uh, in their drawings and stuff like that. So having them uh, come back to site and tell us the meaning of the rock art is also something refreshing. Another site, which is located not far from Pinang, is uh, the Sungai Matu archaeological site in the Bujang Valley. So this is where we actually had our continuous program with the community. Uh, we had a festival, uh, the Kedatua Festival, and also international conference, where we invited the local to be part of it. Uh, we also had a continuous uh, talk and uh, seminars with the locals to give them a further understanding of our research and also archaeology. Uh, we invited schools, children, and the local community to participate and help us with the digging. Uh, they didn't really do much, but you know, at least they learned what we are doing on site and they really enjoyed it. And I think the most important thing is to train the locals. We had a program called Knowledge Transfer Program on Shop on KDP where we, we, we invited uh, the young people you know, uh, school leavers, for example, to be part of the team, to understand archaeology, and uh, they can uh, apply for a tourism license, so they can become a, a certified tour guide on site. So by giving back to the community in this way, it will bring in more money to the community, because uh, the problem with the semi-urban uh, area is that, or the rural area, especially, I, I'm not sure in Thailand, but in Malaysia, is that the appreciation of archaeology is very low because they think archaeology doesn't really bring back money to them. So by giving this kind of opportunity to the, to the people, um, made them realize that archaeology history can be turned into a, a commercial product, but not jeopardizing the preservation and conservation of it. So in the end, I guess, um, the awareness and responsibility um, is one of the most important things in uh, trying to, um, in order to protect the archaeology 
and the heritage of a city. I guess um, in, in all the uh, cities, especially the capital cities in, in South Asia, um, the awareness and responsibility, not just among the city dwellers, but among the key players, among the stakeholders within the city, sometimes it's uh, relatively, relatively low. So I guess for us, the academics, uh, and as well as the concerned citizens like most of you, uh, could play uh, our roles in increasing the awareness and responsibility. And hopefully, uh, in the years uh, to come, we can have more and more archaeological data coming uh, from the city centre itself. Uh, just like uh, what we experience in Europe and the United States. So I guess uh, that's all for my talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Mark. Thank you.
previous sampling that have gone before, except that obviously get kind of compacted hundreds of feet under the earth. Um, do you believe the same thing would exist in Kuala Lumpur, or was that literally a site that no one ever ventured on? Yes. Well, I, 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 that's a very interesting question, the questions that I have myself. Uh, remember in the earlier slides, you have uh, 2800 BC, Neolithic settlement in Klang, 500 BC, Metal Age settlement in Klang, but then suddenly we have 14th century part of Kuala Lumpur. So what happened between 500 BC to 14th centuries? that we don't know. So we know through records there's a lot of Aborigine settlement as well outside of KL. So if you have the Aborigine settlement, you must have a prehistoric settlement. That's why. So this kind of uh, the modern population, the 1800, they come from Sumatra, from Indonesia. What about the local people? You know, the local Aborigines, are, do, they, do they actually breed up? Um, do they actually Travel around. Uh, I know that there was one record in Batu Caves in Kuala Lumpur of the Aborigines that lives there. You know, the big, huge limestone hill in Kuala Lumpur. So there used to be a record, but the studies are still it's still under studies. We we just don't know much about what happened in Kuala Lumpur from 500 BC to 14th century. So whether it's still there. I don't know. But you can actually see from all the, the issues and challenges, the archaeology is still there. If you take a precaution to engage with a proper archaeological research, you can still find artifacts within Kuala Lumpur itself. So I believe the prospect is there, the evidence is still there, the, the, the gravestone, everything is still there, but it's just the effort and multidisciplinary approach, proper research program and of course engagement with the public with the stakeholders so that we can understand more about that in the UK. Thank you. Uh, listening to your talk just now, I never imagined that KL was established in what, eight, 18th century? Um, Malaysia is composed of two parts, Peninsula Malaysia and East Malaysia. By the way, I wondered, what is the oldest monument, perhaps Buddhist, in Peninsula Malaysia? Buddhist monument in Peninsula Malaysia. Right, the oldest one. The oldest monument or the oldest Buddhist monument? Oh, I'm asking you a question. Peninsula Malaysia, I mean Malaysia proper. Okay. Right. Um, the oldest Buddhist monument site. Um, the current record that we have now is from the Bujang Valley, which is north of Peninsula Malaysia, in Bujang Valley. Uh, it's not. Far, it's in Kedah, which is bordering Thailand. It's a state that bordering Thailand in the north part of Peninsula Malaysia. So the name of that area is Bujang Valley. We had evidence of the Hindu Buddhist monument. Uh, the recent date back to 788 BC, but that's not Buddhist monument because Buddhism comes to Malaysia at uh, the. The peninsula of Malaysia in the 4th or 5th century AD. So the oldest, I would say, 4th or 5th century AD uh, within the peninsula of Malaysia itself, uh, in the Bujang Valley in Kedah. So that is currently the oldest, but we believe that we can, hopefully we can find much older monuments once we do more research. One more question. Well, I am sure that you have heard of Zhang He. Chinese, Chinese right. the Emperor. Right, yeah. that one. Do you have any evidence of his visit? In Malaysia? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, like I mentioned just now, I mean, he mentioned Klang. He didn't mention, mention Kuala Lumpur, but he mentioned Klang as one of the cities that he actually um, he'll record in his uh, uh, travel. Uh, to answer Madame's uh, question just now, 
when he becomes capital, why? Well, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the history is very complex, you know, there's a civil war and stuff like that. But basically, it's, it's a combination of uh, political and also economical will among the local, the, the settlers in Kuala Lumpur that time. Uh, of course, there's, a, there's also the, 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 the Sultan, you know, the top people who actually decided that we should uh, recite here because of the tea mining uh, uh, boom, especially in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, so, I guess there's no simple answer to that because it's very complex. There's many um, aspects combined. But it's a very prosperous trading post. So, after a while, that becomes, I would say, becomes the capital of the town. Yeah. And I, I would say it's not, there's no straightforward answer of why it becomes the capital. I'm wondering about the historical context of, uh, of the cemetery. The gravestones in the 1890s are very recent, and I'm wondering what happened that the community forgot about their burial ground. For example, my hometown was founded in 1836, and as far as I know, all of the graves are still there, and the older families still visit the graves from the 1850s. So, was there some kind of population displacement or something like that that happened? I think because it's a very much you know political uh, 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 trading post. So there's a in terms of the uh, influx and outflux of people in Kuala Lumpur, it's, it's a very vibrant and very dynamic movement of people. Plus, I guess it's different. This is my personal opinion. It's also different. I mean, culturally, like in Europe, you have a register. Especially in the graveyard, you have uh, the, the church keep a very good regis uh, uh, list, registry of whoever people got buried in the ground. But in the case of Muslim, especially well, in Kuala Lumpur, that time even for the past seventies or in the nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties, we don't really have that proper registry. So when the, when your great grandfather got buried. I mean, four or five generations, you will not remember it at all. So it's just become a graveyard and it becomes a gravestone. And nobody really cares to read or to, to know who's actually buried there. Because we don't have that kind of standard registry. So after a while, you know, it becomes a, you know, it's, a, it's still respected as a burial ground. But later generations don't really have that connection anymore with the old gravestone or the burial ground. So. Usually it's just two or three, maybe three or four generations, as far as we can remember. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you, Mr. Shai.